And now Goose looks back at the life of a truly influential figure in the gaming industry. On my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer. But in my heart, I am a gamer. With the sudden passing of Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata last month, I and many others were left grieving the loss of a true titan of our industry. And looking back through his life's accomplishments, it's humbling when you realise just how much of an influence on gaming he's had. So I wanted to take this chance to remember and celebrate the life of a man who made it his mission to bring as much joy to the world as he could through the thing he loved most, games. Satoru Iwata was born in 1959 in Sapporo, and by high school, he was already creating basic games on his calculator. My first creation was a baseball game. I don't think anyone can say it has bad graphics, because it has no graphics. <laughs> but when I saw my friends playing that game and having fun, it made me feel proud. To me, this was a source of energy and passion. In his spare time while studying at university, he would help make games with a small group of friends. This group would go on to become HAL Laboratory. He joined them full time after graduating and helped forge a close relationship with Nintendo so they could publish games on the upcoming NES. From that relationship, Awata was instrumental in developing games both with HAL and directly with Nintendo. However, the studio soon found itself struggling financially. So, at the insistence of the president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, Iwata was made the president of HAL in 1993, where he turned their fortunes around. Despite being president, he was always keen to get his hands stuck into the code. And due to his close relationship with Nintendo, he ended up assisting on several of their games. According to many stories, he helped save several games' troubled development and apparently single-handedly ported Pokemon's battle system over to Nintendo 64 for Pokemon Stadium. Perhaps one of his greatest successes came in 1999 when he championed an idea by Masahiro Sakurai to get Nintendo's stable of lovable characters into one game to beat each other up. The idea was met with a lot of scepticism within Nintendo. There were people both inside and outside Nintendo who did not strongly favor our idea. When testers began picking up the controllers, people smiled, then laughed, then began shouting to each other. That was the moment when everything for Smash Brothers changed. The following year, Nintendo hired him and immediately placed him in a senior role as head of corporate planning. Within two years under his watch, Nintendo's profits had increased a massive 41%. And after those two successful years, Nintendo's Hiroshi Yamauchi called Mr. Iwata into his office and revealed he was stepping down as president after half a century and that he wanted Iwata to take over. At Nintendo, we do not run from risk, we run to it. We are taking the risk to move beyond current boundaries. Yamauchi left him in charge with one request, that Nintendo give birth to wholly new ideas and create hardware that reflects that ideal and make software that adheres to the same standard. A request we would see Iwata take to heart. He took charge during the transition between the Nintendo 64 to the less successful GameCube, a tough period for Nintendo. There was stronger competition than ever from Sony and Microsoft, and the previous king of gaming found itself languishing in third place. Only on Nintendo GameCube. But Awata had some grand plans, which were revealed with the DS. The oddball handheld was met with scepticism, especially with Sony's rival PSP expected to crush it in both sales and hardware specs. It is different. But this was Iwata's Nintendo, a Nintendo that didn't want to compete with graphics and hardware. It wanted to compete with fun and unique experiences that spoke to people of all backgrounds. Making games look more photorealistic is not the only means of improving the game experience. I know on this point I risk being misunderstood. So remember, I am a man who once programmed a baseball game with no baseball players. 
If anyone appreciates graphics, it's me. The DS was a massive success, thanks in no small part to its easy-to-use touchscreen and broad range of software. Alongside fan-favourite franchises sat games like Brain Age and Nintendogs, which helped the DS reach that blue ocean of yet-to-be gamers that our industry had almost completely ignored for so long. Our goal to show them surprise, to convince them that above all, video games are meant to be just one thing, fun. In total, it sold over 150 million units, making it the best-selling handheld and second best-selling console of all time. But he wasn't done fishing in that big blue ocean. Codenamed Revolution, the Wii once again left many scratching their heads when they first saw the infamous Wiimote. It breaks down a barrier to non-game. It was a controller that only needed to be picked up to be understood. It proved to be a cultural phenomenon. It created new types of games, new ways to play, and perhaps most importantly, it created new gamers. It was sold out for months after release, and within a year, every family seemed to have a Wii and had transformed into a household of gamers. Today, there are people who play and people who do not. We will help destroy that wall between them. It dominated the market, becoming the only console of the generation to sell more than 100 million units. It was so successful that both rivals eventually created their own motion controls. And, as they say, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. The runaway success of the DS and the Wii was a golden age for Nintendo. Unfortunately, this success proved hard for Iwata to replicate with the 3DS and the Wii U. But both consoles embody his willingness to take risks and try something new and offer something different in an industry that's so often plagued with the same tried and true ideas. And they're both undeniably loaded with great games. Which was a hallmark of Nintendo that Iwata safeguarded beyond all else. To him, it was a company that needed to be committed to making the best games they can, no matter what. They're often thought of as being like the Disney of video games, products always made with a level of assured talent and heart. During his tenure, he also made it a point to take the time to open a dialogue with developers through his lengthy Iwata Asks interviews. It's not about game density, it's about the, the density of play. These gave the creators, who he held in the highest regard, a chance to share their visions and their stories behind the games they made. And of course, he wanted to do the same thing with gamers. Hello, everyone. This is Satoru Iwata from Nintendo. Launching the Nintendo Direct announcements, where they could deliver all the latest updates and news directly to fans, and he always did it with a sense of humour and passion that's almost unheard of from a CEO. In his last few months, Awata made one of his most surprising, yet perhaps inevitable announcements of his tenure, that Nintendo would now be partnering with DNA to make mobile games. A big break from tradition for a company that for years insisted that its business relied on creating exclusive software to sell its hardware. But he recognised that mobile was now where that blue ocean was. And with the billions of mobiles out there, such a move might be the perfect way to get Nintendo's characters and quality games to bring smiles to as many people as they could. Sadly, however, you'll never be able to see that reality take shape. Unless we change, we can never increase the gameplay population. In one of his last public comments, after what many saw as a disappointing showing at this year's E3 by Nintendo, Iwata publicly apologised for it, saying he took gamers' feedback seriously and that they would work better to meet expectations. It's tragic that he left on such a note, with a company on the back foot and a community unimpressed. But such a comment spoke deeply to the type of man that Iwata was. He would speak directly to us, and he'd listen to us no matter what we had to say, always with a humble gratitude that we cared enough to say it. Even if we come from different sides of the world, speak different languages, even if we eat too many chips or rice balls, even if we have different tastes in games, every one of us here today is identical. For me, I'm going to remember him as a man responsible for helping our industry grow and build into something more inclusive and friendly than ever. I'll remember him as a gamer and as a developer who made games loved by millions. As a man who loved games with an infectious passion and made it his life's work to bring that love to the whole world right up until the very end. So thank you, Mr. Iwata, for everything. Everyone of us here today is identical.
in the most important way. Each one of us has the heart of the gamer. Thank you very much for your attention.